I can't tell you how excited I am at what's happening in this room and what will happen over the next seven weeks. And if we get where we want to go, what's going to happen right across Australia in terms of online community empowerment. I feel that deeply in my heart from, from the dint of hard experience from my own childhood where I had a wonderful, loving family and a very difficult economic existence. When I was made honorary fellow at the university, I spoke, uh, had to speak at a function of graduating commerce students. And in short, my message was this, that when I was born in 1933, my mother wasn't expected to live through that birth through malnutrition. And I'm not talking about Southeast Asia, I'm talking about Australia. And as I said to the students, many of you people will be making decisions that will affect the lives of people like my mother and father. And so when you graduate and when you go up through the, the ranks, you will think to yourself, I've made it. I have a nice car, I have a nice home, I've got a good income, I'm a CEO, but I've made it to where? Who am I? What am I? And that's the message that I carry in, in my life. And that's the message of this community empowerment course because it does have the ability to change things. We're living in a very dysfunctional Australia, a very dysfunctional society and politically a very dysfunctional place. And you don't have to be convinced about that over the last few weeks. So in the 07 election I wrote to the major players in a paper which will be available to this school in which I pointed out quite a number of scandals and quite a number of feelings. But I said this at the beginning of the paper. With apologies to Martin Luther King, I have an Australian dream in which our leaders do not play on fears, greed and prejudice, but cultivate harmony, tolerance and the beauty of a multicultural society where tolerance is the reward, where love of difference is the norm, where the gross national product is a measure of happiness, education, rounded personalities and where opportunity, health and wealth sharing is a right. An Australia in which the professional sporting prowess is overshadowed by productive careers of nurses and social workers, while national defence accords with standards of freedom, justice and human rights and not might or capacity to kill and control. Where democracy is not sac uh, sacrificed to pre-selection, party discipline, secrecy, cover-up and mendacity where national theatre is not the national parliament, but a creative nation, school spectaculars, writers' festivals, paintings of light and love and drama, a celebration of cultural richness, depth and difference, where religion is wide, tolerant, humane and passionate about life and liberty. That's what I want you individually, if you don't already feel that in your heart, because this is the message that we can get across Australia. The art of politics is division. The art of a community empowerment is unity. So how are we going to unite so many people of different backgrounds and different political and social views and cultural uh, norms? And the answer is relatively simple. Over the last several decades, the weapons necessary to access power and decentralisation of resources have been progressively taken away from us. We can be united on those goals of true liberty, true freedom of speech, law that's to do with justice, not just process. Information access. 
resources decentralised into the communities where we live. Decisions made by people who are most affected by them and closest to them, because that's the most efficient way that we can run Australia. The myth is that it's all too complicated. You must have this huge structure. You must have people in a remote parliament to make those decisions for you. You must have a large bureaucracy of experts in inverted commas. Nobody is more expert than you about your community and collectively nobody is more knowledgeable and nobody is more fitted to carry through solutions, make decisions and use resources. And so today is a realisation of a dream that I've had in my heart for a long time. I've been through the ringer many times. I've seen the absolute stupidity and the depravity and the pompousness of Parliament. I have seen Askin, Lewis, Willis, Rann, Greiner, um, Fay, Carr, Unsworth, and uh, just a minute, I'll try and count the, the last ones. They're interested in power, they're not interested in change. In every single regime that I've seen in the New South Wales Parliament, none of the weapons that we need to access the system, to defend ourselves, to build our communities, to get the resources, to make the decisions, none of those have come through any of those administrations. Remember what the Irish say about politicians, they're all the same, some of them. <laughs> Never forget it. We have some wonderful speakers coming up. One of them is Justice Michael Kirby who used to help Clover and Peter and I when we held the balance of power and we had to, to deal with constitutional questions. He was very generous and, and um, as an aside he would help us and I pleaded with him to come and he is coming. Mind you, it took a telegram, the final telegram when I was starting to get nervous about whether he had come and I, I sent him, a, not a telegram, I sent him, I sent him a short email that said, uh, would you please come and, and add your, your um, shining example to our school? Would it help if I sent Rich Owen Meisner around? <laughs> I immediately got a response, will do for you. <laughs> So, in that paper, I just want to cover a couple of points. This is what I said, at all levels of government, local, state and federal, the cults of deniability, secrecy, the lack of accountability, avoidance and diffusion of responsibility, corruption of process are growing weapons necessary to storm the cult citadels or even prize open the doors are diluted and diminished every day. The unease, suspicion and powerlessness in Australian society are manifested in the formation of numerous disparate groups with specific interests, many possessing their own websites. The purpose of this course is to identify what powers, rights and weapons are needed by the community groups and individuals to be effective participants in a free and truly democratic society. Each one of these groups will have a different focus and a different approach. But the key emphasis I want to make to you is we need these common weapons and we need to claw them back. Recently in a paper on the rise of Obama, this, the phrase communitarianism rose. And communitarianism is where, well I thought was normal, where communities interact amongst themselves. They argue and they fight and they uh, chew the fat and so on, but they come to a, a solution out of mutual respect and understanding of their community. Now we can unite these disparate groups around this nation if we clearly identify 
what we want in order that we might speak freely. You see, you don't elect your Member of Parliament. Your Member of Parliament is chosen by a small group of people within a faction, within a political party. And without any uh, derogatory comment about anybody, if you put a label on a dog in Kembla and it's a, and it's a Labor label, it'll get elected. Well, up to now, anyway. If you put a Liberal label, label on somebody in Karingai, it'll get elected. Where does Tripodi get his power from? Where does Obeid get his power from? Where does any of these people get their power from? Because the whole system is rigged. The pre-selection's rigged. The election is rigged. And as this course proceeds, I will show you, in my view, how the elections are rigged. And the Parliament doesn't make laws. The bureaucrats make the laws under the instructions of a small group, often a subgroup of Cabinet, and then they're rubber stamped by the Parliament. The Parliament doesn't safeguard free speech. Anybody that's ever stepped out of the trenches and spoken up against their political party knows that. The Parliament doesn't safeguard your access to justice. All of the things that we are taught as children each and every one of them does not happen in our democratic society. I'm pretty well switched on, but I'll tell you what, I can't vote in the Senate other than tick the box unless I know the whole 70 odd members and I put one to 70, my vote is not valid. Why is that so? Because it's fixed. Why can't I vote for one or two or three or four that I happen to know and it be a valid vote? Because they want you to tick the box so that they can organise the preference. And the Upper House in New South Wales, for example, that's where the obeds come from. It's a circus. You look after me in business and you're a Liberal Party or in mining if you're in the National Party or in the unions if you're a, li a Labor man, I'll organise you into the upper house. You stay there a couple of terms, ta-da, you've got a pension, you leave a vacancy and I'll move the next person up. And you get Robertson now, who's a minister, never had to face the people. So I'll be talking about things like that and so will other speakers and I'll be talking about the corruption of process and the deep-rooted corruption of our political system. But most of all, I'll be focusing on you can, we must, and this is how to. And that's why I'm excited today. Because what's happening with people listening in Bega or in Moss Vale or in Batemans Bay or Nowra is going to happen right across Australia. It may need a major sponsor. It may need somebody with vision but I think we can do it and I hope that you will enjoy the course and share the excitement that I feel. And if you want to sum up my attitude, I like to write little ditties. And I remember one when the judges are parading at the opening of Parliament and they're all there in their Superman outfits with their red and their ermine trim, thinking, when confronted by pomp and paraphernalia, Remember this, inter alia, beneath regal robes and official regalia lurk common genitalia. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, sorry to keep you waiting, ladies and gentlemen. I've just had... Uh, I'm, uh, I'm just under instructions from Glenn which is certainly not my nature. He says no questions today, but still, I don't think I've ever obeyed instructions in my life. <laughs> uh, because apparently on Wednesday, I will be speaking on for two hours. There'll be an hour plus an hour questions on Wednesday on breaks on power. And um, so there would be plenty of opportunity then if we don't get an opportunity now.
I'll just read out some of my uh, references to definitions. So what is democracy? To paraphrase John Ralston Saul in The Unconscious Civilization, democracy is a system which facilitates the obligation to dissent. Now the more you think about that, the better it gets. It's a system which facilitates the obligation to dissent. And that's exactly the opposite to what we're told. That dissent is destabilising. Somehow dissent is not democratic. Dissent is them and us. What I'm saying is dissent is us. Because if you don't feel the obligation to speak out when your heart or your beliefs tell you that something is wrong, then you are letting democracy down because that's what it is. And so the theme that I started earlier in the day is right on. That is that we have to facilitate the obligation to dissent. Another definition, what are Australian parliaments? And I can get these printed off for you if you want to save a bit of time. What are Australian parliaments? Well, this is a John Hattonism. Parliaments are a series of political parties to which the citizenry is not invited. <laughs> and that's precisely, I'm telling you, that's precisely what the situation is. The membership of the political parties in Australia is at is very, very low indeed. And one of the problems with the democratic structure is unlike some other countries, which I'll talk about in a moment, if you win, win government, as did Hawke for example, didn't win 50% of the vote, but got elected nevertheless, he gets 100% of the resources. The public servants work for the parliament, theoretically, but they don't. The public servants work for the government. And I'm continuously irritated by people um, who tell public servants to shut up. Howard was a classic example. He did something that in any true democracy is quite unthinkable. He forbade his ministers from appearing before a parliamentary committee to inquire into the children overboard affair. He then went a stage further and said, my staffers are not going to appear and neither are public servants going to appear in senior levels. Now a parliament is the highest court in the land. A parliamentary committee should be able to subpoena the Prime Minister. And if they waste the Prime Minister's time, so it'd be on the committee member's head. In that paper I referred to earlier, which I won't turn up the reference now because it's written there, I refer to the number of times, for example, that American presidents had to, had to appear before a Senate committee. It doesn't happen in Australia. Parliamentary committees are fixed. I want you to ask me to come back to that because I'm going to make a number of bald statements such as I did earlier that you don't elect your representative and the parliamentary committees are fixed. If we thought about how we're going to change the system, we're not talking revolution, we're talking about common sense. I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to get a drink earlier. I did a Churchill Fellowship and went to Sweden and Canada. I knew precisely who I wanted to see and what I wanted to ask because for years and years I have builded my head against brick walls, secrecy, uh, misuse of power and so on. I was a bit of a um, a novelty in Sweden because they don't have independence, they only have party members. 
And so they were very interested to, to speak with me and to get my point of view and I was extremely interested in speaking with them. But I'm going to come down to two essential points which would revolutionise Australia. That is, to make it an offence to interfere with a public servant in the rightful, lawful, efficient uh, performance of their duty. And at the same time in balance, to make the public servant specifically responsible for their area of administration subject to the Justice Ombudsman as is the case in Sweden, the Justice Ombudsman is the most powerful Ombudsman in the country and there are quite a lot of them. The second thing is that public servants in Sweden have a legal right to free speech. You can imagine what would happen in our, in our society if in fact as a Member of Parliament or as a, a, a mover and shaker I sought to prevent a public servant from speaking and in fact I was committing a defence in law. And why not? We pay them. It's a matter of attitude. When I walk up to a counter and I want all of you, if you haven't already got this attitude, to adopt it instantly, <laughs> be polite. First question in your mind before you begin to speak, you never lose sight of it, what am I employing you for? Now, that might sound a simple thing, but it isn't. It isn't. When you walk up and you speak to an engineer in the council, is that engineer engineering? I mean, real engineering. We know the sort of engineering that goes on, but I mean the real McCoy. <laughs> if, they've, if they've got somebody there whose job it is, um, to facilitate the delivery of social services in the community. Is that what they're really doing? So immediately when you confront that particular officer, you are thinking about what's this person's job description? Why am I employing them? And immediately you're focused. Because I, I find myself getting caught up, if you're not careful, in the games. You've got to cut that right away and you keep on the point. What am I employing you for? Don't tell me I can't have that information. That information belongs to me. I and all my fellow ratepayers or public servants paid you to collect that information. That's my information. It's not your information. But you bloody well tell me I can't, have, I can't know what's going on. It's a matter of attitude. It's right down to the very point of how society should work. There is nothing, and I mean nothing, in local government that you should not be able to know. As Ted Mack says, the smart money will always find out. There's no such thing as inconfidence in a council. There's no such thing as a confidential committee. The smart money will always find out. And your best protection against corruption is that all of us know what's going on. Now there are some specific areas such as security at the Commonwealth level, obviously, and protection of the, um, the, the finances of the realm, as they like to call them. There has to be, on occasions, budget secrets, but I'm not so sure that the money market doesn't know them anyhow, before you and I get to know them on budget night. But outside of very narrow limits, I can't think in 22 years in Parliament of anything that would endanger the public interest if I didn't know about it. It's exactly the opposite. For example, the Sydney Harbour Tunnel's costing trillions of dollars and it will go on costing huge amounts of money. Breton signed the contract under commercial incompetence. I call it commercial incon incontinence. <laughs> well, that's what it does to me anyway. But what the hell's knew about being able to build a tunnel under a harbour, as if they hadn't done it before. Every time you see commercial inconfidence as a reason why you can't know what's in a contract, be alert, because it's a fix. There's no question about that. So what is the public service? 
They're our employees. What is the bureaucracy? A conspiracy against those who employ them. What is a contract public servant? A contract public servant is a contractual contradiction of public service. Think about contract public servants. Almost without fail they give the minister what the minister wants to know, not what the minister needs to know. For all its failings, <coughs> the um, independence of the public service was the most valuable thing we had. It's almost totally destroyed. It's gone way past level one, two and three of the public service now. The interference from government goes down even to the lower echelons. And I know that from talking with public servants. One of the things that made me powerful, even though I was only an individual, is that the public service network that we built up in our office, and I say we, it was a flat structure. I had Alan Barry, who I employed out of my own pocket for 15 years or something. He came to me as a whistleblower and we blew the lid off what was then the Department of Motor Transport <coughs> and he was the first to get the sack naturally. Uh, I had a volunteer who used to do all the appointments. I had an ex-Navy World War II bloke who used to, who was a shining um, researcher. And I had two people who were provided by the Parliament. When I first went into Parliament, I was, every member of Parliament had to share, uh, five members of Parliament had to share one secretary. There weren't any electoral officers. I want to point out this anomaly while I think of it. How is it that when you want to access the bureaucracy, you've got no resources at all? You've got to do your own typing, you've got to do your own research, you've got to do your own photocopying, you've got to do your own mailing, you've got to do this and you've got to do that. And at the same time, you've got to uh, earn a living and feed a family and survive. And of course, that's the system's designed to do that. So one of the first ways you and your communities ought to be empowering yourselves is to hang, hammer on members of parliament forward and say, we want a community secretariat. Why should you have all the resources? Why should you have $100,000 a year now in printing allowances? No wonder you get swamped with garbage. $100,000 a year and they can accumulate part of that and keep it for an election year. It's an absolute total disgrace. But you, you want to try and access community grants, you've got to prepare your own stuff. And then they'll just flick it if they want to. So you do not have those resources. So I'm going to come uh, get to the core of where I want to go. What are elections? It's a license to program the audience. Elections are a license to program the audience. Listen to any election campaign. They get on the mantra and they repeat it and they repeat it and they repeat it and they repeat it and it drives you absolutely bombing. Right. When they're asked a question, they switch it around and repeat it again. So the election process is distorted in many, many ways and in a later um, session we'll go into that and I want you to make notes and remind me of these things because there's a million disparate things that we can talk about. But elections are fixed. <coughs> make no mistake about it, they're fixed. So you don't elect your Member of Parliament. And what are pre-selections? There are ways to fudge elections. And as I mentioned earlier, that's where these Mitchens and Tripodis and Obeeds. Have you seen the Herald on Saturday? Obeed has been in Parliament for seven years and never spoken a word. He doesn't have to. I call him he who must be obeyed. <laughs> I'm going to go through a parliamentary day. So what happens is there's a prayer and my God we need that. But it never seems to be answered. 
The speaker opens with a prayer. Then the speaker says, have minister's papers to lay on the table. In that ten minutes, you are governed. Because that's when the ministers stand up in their order of seniority in cabinet and they table regulations with monotonous regularity. So the laws that are made are umbrella laws which give the ministers, read slash public servants slash staffers, the right to govern you. They make the regulations. If those regulations are not questioned, they lay on the table for 15 sitting days and if they're not questioned, they be automatically become law. And that tells you how to run your small business that tells you what you must pay and must not pay, that tells you when to salute and when to sit down and when to stand up and all the other things it does for you. The plethora of regulations which are seldom reviewed is enormous. People complain about the days that Parliament doesn't sit. I'm telling you, you're better off when they don't. Every day they sit, they're crowding your liberty. And I'll come back to that. Okay, then, there's question time. And woe betide any member of parliament who doesn't get permission to ask the question without notice prior to the sitting of the parliament. That's a fact of life. If you're in a political party, you clear that question with the party in the party room before you stand up and ask questions without notice. And if you don't, woe betide you, especially if it's an awkward question. And that made me an interesting person because they didn't know at question time when I was going to throw a bouquet or a grenade. And Jack Ferguson said that once at the opening of the Narrow Police Station. Uh, uh, he was there representing the Premier and opening a new Narrow Police Station. And he said... Um, I'm always relieved when Jack sits down at question time because I know what he was going to ask. <laughs> I've gone as long as six weeks and never been seen because you don't have an independent chairperson in the parliament. The speaker is controlled. You remember Whitlam sitting cope down when he was the um, speaker. Or I have seen Rand when Kelly's on his feet, Speaker Kelly's on his feet, Laurie Kelly, and when the Speaker's on his feet, there's a lot going on. The Speaker normally controls the sitting down. Rand jumps up and does that and the Speaker sits down. And in the book, uh, The Stench in This Parliament, that Ruth wrote on my political career, uh, Rizzoli, who's one of the best Speakers we've had in recent times in the Parliament, a uh, Liberal Speaker, uh, he says that quite openly, that the Speaker's got to do what the political party says. We have an independent Speaker, have an independent Speaker for the first time in many years and things have dramatically changed. So questions without notice are a farce. Questions on notice are where you can get your MP to put all sorts of questions. At one stage I had 90 odd questions on the police and it has to be a way to get the message through. If you read those questions one after the other you don't need the answer because you can see the pattern coming through. So the parliament is all about silencing dissent, not encouraging dissent. It's all about control, not liberating and that control starts at the electorate and runs right through. You see, as I said in one, in one of the notes in the speech, I'm your local member so sit up, shut up and listen. That's what it's about. You listen to them. You listen to them. They don't listen to you, right? What should a local member be? A local member should be a facilitator and that's the most important word I've given you today, facilitator. A public servant is a facilitator. 
a member of parliament is a facilitator, so is a, um, a councillor on the council, a facilitator. They should facilitate the needs and aspirations of that community that they represent. So in, uh, members of parliament grace public meetings. We are so grateful when they turn up at a public meeting. We are so grateful when they speak to us. That's bovine excreta, of course. The fact is they ought to be sitting in the audience like you are, listening to what we've got to say. Now I'm not talking from theory here. People have often said, okay, 22 years in Parliament, he neglected his electorate, you know, yeah, they, they attack, attack, attack all the time. And as I say to young people, if you're not being criticised, you're not doing anything. If you're being criticised, you're starting to get somewhere and if you're being rubbished, you're really going places. And that's, that's the basic rule. That's the basic rule. So, uh, how did I interact with the electorate? There, they have the knowledge that I need. So what I tried to do was to call meetings and there'd often be about the same number of people as we got in this room. And there'd be people in this room from, from docs, uh, from mental health, uh, community health, from sporting organisations, from a whole range of people. And they were learning from each other because it was a, uh, a free interchange. And I would say to them, wait a minute, look, why don't we do this? What, have you thought of this? Like uh, forming the big, bigger community sports council. Instead of it, you and the soccer players and, and, the, football and the rugby players and, and hockey players all competing against each other, why don't you get together, form some sort of a plan as to multi-use of fields and how we can best use the resources. Then give me some idea of how we can go about getting that. And the public servants who were present learnt about how the system worked and how they could interact with each other and ring each other up because we live in a compartmental society. So the compartmentalism is not only at the top where I'm telling you in the parliamentary dining room in the New South Wales Parliament, the Libs, not just the Libs don't sit with the Nationals or the Nationals and the Libs don't sit with the Labor, but the left of the Labor Party doesn't sit with the right of the Labor Party at lunch. I sat there in that parliament lonely many times, eating on my own. It's an awful place to work, an awful place to work. If you're a part of the team, then you've got it made. You can go and play snooker, you can answer your letters. I'm not saying they don't work, they do. A lot of members of parliament work extremely hard. But time after time after time, I'm sitting on the back bench, the division bells ring, they come up and they sit alongside of me and they say, what are we voting on, Jack? They got no idea. The whip and the leader of the house on both sides controls what's happening tells them what's happening, instructs them on what's happening. And it's got to the stage where it's really out of control because backbench members of parliament really do not know what is actually happening at the higher echelons within the party and within the cabinet. They think they do because there's three groups of members of parliament. There's the good honest Joes and Josephines who work hard for their electorate. They're not particularly interested in promotion. There's another group who are interested in the promotion and will climb over anybody's back to get it. And there's a top group who can play the other two groups like a violin. And they play the press gallery like a violin. See, these are the secrets. They call a press conference. I'll give you a demo. Neville Rand was a master. Right. Call a press conference, you're all the press, cameras everywhere, people making notes, all the rest of it. In walks Rand, a couple of minders, gives his, delivers his statement, minders say, oh, oh, that's all ladies and gentlemen, out Rand goes. Right? John Fay walks in, 
Very nice fellow. I like him. Gives his press conference. Questions? Yes, 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 right. And away he goes. Three minutes left. See? He's in a, I'm in a party now. <laughs> <laughs> and away he goes. All right. And uh, go down the press room. They're not interested in his main statement while he called the press conference. They're rolling the tape. And you can see all these little boxes where people are rolling tapes. That's the bit we want. <laughs> he makes some stumble. Bang. That's the six o'clock news. That's what's happening. Six o'clock. That ten minutes. And particularly ran. Listen, mate, we know where your bloody bread and butter is. We know who your bosses are. You stick your neck out again and don't bother turning up at this uh, exclusive press conference that we're going to have next week or whatever. I'm telling you that the people in power in Parliament know what buttons to press in terms of the press. And there are several members of the press who have been outspoken who, make, who they make their life difficult or try to. But of course the press talk with each other. But one of the major problems that I discovered uh, a phrase in Canada which covers it, the loss of memory of the house. Many times people would ring me and uh, from the press and I'd be staggered at their ignorance because the press gallery is constantly changing. If only we had a press gallery full of Ramses, for example, who know the tricks, who write fearlessly, we haven't got them. Investigative journalism is almost dead because of defamation. So what I've tried to do today is to tell you why you should commit suicide. <laughs> and I've only got, what, 30 seconds left. Well, there's one good reason why you shouldn't do it. It's against the gun laws. Now, <laughs> these are the measures or the symptoms of corruption. Secrecy, close relationships, unusual decisions, intimidation of staff, ruthless punishment of whistleblowers, contemptuous treatment of public duty, cover-ups and lack of responsiveness and failure to keep proper records. You fill in the blank. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>